okay welcome uh, all uh, this is our great honor and pleasure that we are going to start uh, sangam talk show episode 4 uh, uh, almost 4 months passed away uh, but you know it is good to see that this talk show is uh, getting some recognition and interest of people uh, here uh, today uh, it is our pleasure and honor to have uh, india development and relief fund organization a non profit organization uh, who is working um, uh, from maryland and uh, they are working to on the south asian countries uh, in india nepal and uh, sri lanka uh, in various factor uh, in various um, uh, through the various ngos of those uh, of these countries uh, and uh, i want to uh, mm, uh, bring uh, uh, your attention and uh, i want to request you to welcome uh, their uh, ac members uh, but before that i want to uh, start with a, a quotation uh, which i like is that you know success is uh, no accident uh, it's a combination of hard work perseverance learning studying sacrifice and most of all love what you are doing and learning to do so uh, in uh, late 1960s uh, one late 20 years old uh, person came in this country uh, with a high dream after uh, finishing uh, his masters uh, in india uh, and he uh, came to mit uh, to finish uh, to start his um, uh, phd program uh, in economics and uh, after finishing uh, this phd uh, he joined in uh, world bank Uh, and uh, he was very successful in his uh, career and then in 1988 he thought that you know why not to do something else um, so he quit his comfortable job and life and started something uh, which is uh, which was his passion uh, i'm sure and in this way uh, this idrf uh, has started uh, so i want to welcome uh, dr vinod prakash uh, he is the founder and ceo of uh, india development and relief fund and with him we have uh, mr dilip thitte uh, he is the vice president uh, of this organization dr prem garg uh, he is a treasurer and um, vandana ji uh, she is the chief operation officer so dr prakash welcome uh, i on behalf of uh, um, sangam uh, welcome you all uh, here so uh, very very first question i have that you know uh, how it happened how idrf started and what motivated you to start idrf amitabh ji and uh, the entire sangam team first of all let me express my deepest gratitude to all of you for providing us this opportunity to share our experience with you uh, basically <clears throat> uh, if i go back to my earliest possible days uh, it was not that uh, i would get settled in usa or do this or that but uh, life events occur and in my own case first of all being born in family of freedom fighters so i had vivid recollection of a quit india movement of 1942 when my mother all unmarried sisters brothers and bhabhi offered satyagraha so that uh, and earning for social justice was there and then <clears throat> fortunately i was good in studies though financially uh, my family was not well off but uh, i went to calcutta uh, which is in those days was very famous indian statistical institute and <clears throat> then i realized that all this education i am not paying and like me millions of indians in india millions of students in india 
are not paying. It is the society at large which is taking care of us. So shouldn't we have this moral obligation to pay back? That should be ingrained in our lives from the very beginning. But uh, so I was looking for keeping in mind this thing. Uh, fortunately, uh, I was a beneficiary of a Ford Foundation. Now Ford Foundation has done wonders in terms of supporting thousands of scholars, students like me. And uh, I feel that uh, uh, I received the benefit for three years, so I should pay back to the society. So that is the, in other words, a strong feeling of uh, social justice and giving back to the society. Uh, <clears throat> moving forward, uh, when I got uh, my normal family life and uh, was privileged to join the World Bank and as a result I had numerous opportunities to visit India and other countries as well. And uh, especially in India, we, we visited not just our families, we had our young children, two sons in those days, young, and we took them to the streets, to the uh, slums and rural areas. They saw poverty with their own eyes. As a result, when they grew up, first of all, when I decided uh, in 1988 to give up my World Bank job and start this uh, India Development Relief Fund as a full-time volunteer. I consulted them and they agreed, yes, Papa or Dad, it is okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <clears throat> Not only that, when much later, when they married, none of them, our sons, Sanjay and Gautam, none of them received personal wedding gifts. So in our uh, invitation, we mentioned no personal gifts, which if somebody wishes to donate, sorry, give gift, that gift should be for in IDRF. So <clears throat> though it was not liked by the some of our Indian community members and friends, but uh, that is what we adhered to. So not only that, that is spirit of giving back, and now this is, I'm jumping, and it is about uh, six, seven years ago, the, my, our grandchildren of a <coughs> younger son who is local, uh, it was, we were celebrating Diwali. Uh, but in part of uh, celebration, they opened their piggy banks and all the $150 they donated to IDRF, which we shared with their permission on IDRF Facebook. And then another friend's daughter chipped in. She took out her piggy bank and donated all her $40, $50. So this is a kind of chain reaction, and I hope uh, this will uh, continue for a long, long time. I am going to leave this planet. I don't know uh, how soon, but uh, uh, we have a wonderful, a very assertive, active, board, um, two of them are already here. You uh, mentioned their names, so I don't have to repeat, but there are uh, some others also. And uh, you have mentioned Vanna, that is we have uh, Neeti. So I have a strong support of dedicated, small dedicated IDRS administrative team and so on. And as a result, uh, <coughs> 
we have succeeded in keeping our admin cost or overheads to the bare minimum, which may be unheard in USA. Uh, for instance, in our case, office is free. I, my home is IDRF's office. And uh, uh, for the first 15 uh, years or so, I was doing everything, taking advantage of World Bank facilities. So the admin cost was literally zero. But then some people question, I must be manipulating this or that. How can it be? So I started uh, then uh, audit of IDRF. And of course, we started incurring uh, some cost. But uh, um, the team, which is Vanna and Neeti, they are full time. They are dedicated to serve their motherland as I, as well as the idea of board of directors are uh, serving their motherland. Uh, so I think uh, this has given me immense joy. And believe it or not, uh, it acted as an insurance policy for me. Uh, nobody expects ever to lose eyesight completely. I'm totally blind for the last almost 12 years. But for this IDRF, my deep commitment, passion, whatever it is, God knows if I would have ever come out of that deep depression, which was very natural, by when uh, losing oversight and uh, this satisfaction or consolation that neither the three ophthalmologists who were responsible for this, though one of them was, but anyway, all three of them were uh, responsible, nor the emergency ER doctor uh, were my enemies, but it was my destiny. And what saved me is the inner joy, Atma Santushti, which I was receiving uh, uh, through IDRF. So my urge is, of course, first, I wish no one should have bad luck like me. But uh, if uh, they are Serving the community at large, others, it is what is called parokka, uh, but there, there also, uh, this arm santushti is there. So that is a great thing. And let me stop. Uh, uh, and if any queries or questions, uh, so uh, have, of course, either I or Dilip Ji will follow up. Thank you for uh, you know, sharing. Uh, you know, it, is, it is highly motivational for uh, us and for anybody else. Uh, so like we, we got a chance to work with IDRF um, last year and uh, the uh, few, few data which you provided that uh, your, your uh, admin cost is very less. I know there are many uh, reputed organizations in this country which has 50%, 60% admin cost. Uh, but you know the uh, but you know there are some organizations like IDRF has um, less than five percent and in this way Sangam uh, as as a, a small non profit organization our admin cost is also like you know probably one percent because you know all our uh, all our uh, volunteer and we don't have any uh, particular office we 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 keep home as a office so uh, so you know th there is some matching uh, if I can say that you know um, uh, matching uh, thinking level. Uh, so uh, I know personally that IDRF work in the South Asian countries like India, Nepal, um, and also Sri Lanka. And uh, you you do a lot of you don't just give the money because that is not the ultimate uh, way to um, uh, you know elevate the level of the um, you know people's life. You do some other steps, and I want to learn from and I, I want to educate uh, and get educated uh, from Dilip Ji that how. IDRF works. Uh, could you please throw some light, Dilip Ji? Uh, sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
I will use the uh, help of a few slides to explain so that it becomes more uh, clear for everyone. So with your permission, I'm going to share my screen. And we have tested this before, started the program, so it should work OK. Um, uh, can you see the screen? Yes. And I'm going to put it on a uh, mode which will show. So as Amit said rightly, that IDRF mission is not just to put charity, but put power in the hands of those who are in the need. In India, Sri Lanka, and uh, Bangladesh, uh, sorry, uh, Nepal. The empowering the marginalized people with skills and services. It is the old adage we subscribe to, which is instead of giving a fish, you teach them how to fish so that they become self-sufficient. And that is, that is our motive, our motto. Uh, we are focused on these three countries and we operate through partnership with local NGOs. We know that we live here. However, the work has to be done on the ground. So across the country, we have a number of NGOs which we vet and we work with them as our partners. And we, in our activities, there's absolutely no uh, concern or we don't uh, regard race, religion, caste, creed, or anything of that sort. Anybody who's in the need and is our NGO is doing a good work, we support that NGO. Uh, next one. These are the six focus areas uh, we have programs. The health, education, women's empowerment, good governance, uh, disaster relief, and eco-friendly. I'll give you a couple of examples. In the health, for instance, we were involved in starting a hospital in Aurangabad called uh, through the Ambedkar uh, Vaidyakiya uh, Samstan. And that hospital has grown now because of the local support, because of the support from a number of doctors in the United States, as well as locally in India. And now it's a major, major hospital. In fact, they're building one more uh, in Assam in the tribal areas. Uh, we started a project with them uh, on, uh, in Assam, not with them, with another uh, organization called Vivekananda Kendra on a mobile van, medical van. And mobile van was so successful in Assam that um, you know, it, it grew. And what was very interesting, many of you are doctors here in the audience, that because of the, the mobile van would go to the tribal areas, less supported areas, and do the medical tests and uh, assessments. And through that, they found out. That, yes, go ahead. Uh, could you please uh, uh, go to the next slide? I think you're talking to the second slide. Uh, no, I'm talking about uh, to, the, to this, this part, health. Uh, sir, your, uh, I think the uh, screen is not refreshing. You are showing focus area, but uh, we are only looking at the mission. Oh. Yeah, so I don't know. Amiji, you can see. To, yeah, it's not refreshing. Okay, let me do this. Can you see now? No, uh, yeah, now, now it's fine. Yeah, can you put it on the slideshow, sir? Maybe that. Yeah, I was putting it on slideshow and you could not see it that time. So oh, okay. Who is reduce this? Yeah. Yeah, now, yeah, it's, uh, it's okay. good. I'll, there are more than one ways to skin a cat. Thank you. Okay, I'm glad you brought it out to my attention because I could see it, uh, the slideshow, but uh, okay. So these are the six focus areas. Uh, those of you who are, uh, who missed it, uh, the health, health, education, women's empowerment, good governance, eco-friendly uh, development and disaster relief. And I was going to giving uh, some example uh, in the area of health. Uh, for instance, we were involved with that. Uh, uh, hospital, as I mentioned, we were also involved with a project which was started by Vivekananda Kendra in the mobile van. The mobile van would go to uh, less serviced areas and tribal areas and do some uh, testing and uh, checking and examination of the patients. And the doctor's team got involved and they, through that, they realized that, hey, there is a need for uh, eye hospital, eye care, eye camps. 
there is a need for uh, er, anemic relief for young girls. And as a result, some of the doctors came forward and they picked up the ball and they started setting up eye, eye camps and some of the other areas. So what I'm trying to emphasize is we sow the seed, it, it proliferated, it grew, and it has become sustainable now. It is growing and in, uh, in both horizontally, in more services, as well as vertically in deeper services. Um, similar is the situation with education. Uh, Shiksha Bharati is an example, comes to my mind. There was a need in Assam for uh, tribal girls. Tribal girls needed a place to go to the town so that they can stay and study. And so the girls' hostel was, being, uh, was built with some of our help. But once it was built, people, local people, as well as many NRIs got involved. They started doing endowment and it just picked up the momentum. And now uh, we have a fairly large girls' hospital. Plus, they also have, uh, it has expanded from just, from being uh, just a school to at a college area, college level area. And some of the alumni of that uh, Shiksha Bharati, they have graduated, they have started businesses, and now they are becoming very conscious that, hey, this school helped us uh, grow, so we, we should donate some part of our profits or some of, some part of our income for the support of the next generation coming up behind us. And that has now slowly becoming self-sustaining. So our focus is to make a project so that it becomes self-sustaining. Uh, we've done that in women's empowerment. We have a number of NGOs we work with, which are involved with the microcredit. And as the women grow their business, whether it is in farming, whether it's in vermiculture, whether it's in uh, rearing goats or uh, cows, as they grow in business, they start putting money back into that microcredit to help their systems. So it, is, it becomes slowly sustainable. Similarly, we are doing uh, things in good governance. Um, there is a lot of money government of India spends for the rural development, but the money never reaches the people who need to get. And uh, this through women's empowerment, through the self-help groups, and through our volunteer organizations that we partner with, we make them aware that, hey, there are funds for you here. And this is how you should apply. This is how you, should, you can get it. That way, the good governance projects also, then people become more aware and they, they are becoming more aware of their rights, what the government is giving them, and they, they demand that. So Gram Panchayat, they're getting involved with Gram Panchayat, they're asking questions, and that is what our focus is, to make them sustainable. Um, of course, the eco-friendly development, <clears throat> we've done a lot of interesting things. One, one interesting thing you will find is a picture here with these wheels. These are called uh, water wheels. Uh, the girls, uh, there are some villages where the girls have to walk three to four kilometers one way in order to bring water. And twice a day, they would go bring some part of water for the household. And as a result, we, and generally this job was done by the girls. So the boys would either go to school or the men would go to work and the women were basically going back and forth with water. With this water wheel project, what has happened is they were able to develop and design this wheel so that it can be pushed and a big wheel, uh, water wheel can carry up to 55 gallons, uh, liters of water and it can be distributed amongst three families. So one, one person's round trip can take care of three families. As a result, the girls are now able to go to school and uh, it's interesting to notice that the women folks in the household, they want their girls to go to school and learn. Everybody wants their girls to learn, learn, but because of some of these chores, because of these uh, difficulties, uh, the necessities uh, prevent them from going to this kind of education. Now, this has helped. And now uh, some of the local businesses are getting involved. So Water Wheel is a very good example of how a little bit of innovation uh, can help improve education. As the education grows, you all know that Education is the key 
to growth and prosperity. Um, disaster relief, we did a lot of disaster relief, uh, whether it's earthquakes, whether it's uh, floods, tsunamis, or uh, lately, last year, it was the COVID. And we did a lot of work in the COVID. So these are the six areas we operate in. But the three points I want to make, the areas are across in terms of functionality, children, women, men, vocation, environment, uh, governance, all of those areas. Secondly, uh, it's sustainable. We Every time we take a project, we make sure that the project self-sustains so that we don't have to keep just giving money, but we give the money so that it proliferates and it, it uh, grows. And the third thing is they are all across the country. Where in all across the country? Let's see. Okay. Let me go to the next one. So uh, over the last uh, 33 years, we have uh, supported projects uh, with 90 plus NGOs across the countries uh, uh, in excess of $42 million. That's, that's, uh, we're very proud of that. And uh, we make sure that all of the NGOs selected are dedicated and they're vetted properly so that the project goes as defined. And uh, we personally take interest in all of these projects. In fact, board of directors is all voluntary work. And we personally take care of or keep track of some of the projects uh, which are going on in India. Let me, yeah, this map gives you an idea about how well we are spread out. Uh, it's predominantly in India. Uh, there are some in Nepal and some in Sri Lanka, but uh, predominantly in India. Uh, let me go to the next one. Uh, why IDRS? What is so unique? There are many uh, charitable nonprofit organizations in the United States which uh, look after or do some work in India. Uh, what is so unique? IDRF. We feel that IDRF is unique in that. It does three things for our, it's an extremely uh, NRI donor friendly organization, which does, does three things for the NRI. If the, uh, the person living here, he wants to uh, donate for a specific project or a specific NGO, we can do that provided the NGO meets our standards. And our standards are fairly high. The NGO has to have the proper FCRA approval, proper uh, project, um, uh, definition and they monitor it so that it becomes self-sustaining. So as long as that is professionally done, the NGO becomes an approved NGO for us and we can work with it. So you can do for a, a specific project or a specific NGO. Secondly, if you are, want to do something in a specific geography, if you are a Bengali, you want to do something in West Bengal or if you are a um, uh, Andhra and you want to do something in Andhra Pradesh, or you're Marathi, you want to do something in Maharashtra, you can say that, hey, I want to do a project in Maharashtra in children's education. And we will be able to find an NGO which will do that in specific, that particular area. There are NRIs who come from a specific village or specific district, and they feel that, you know, the people in that district help them educate. So I want to give back to them. And, and that's how where the geography comes into play. Then the third thing is the focus area. Some people are focused on an area, like a number of our donors are medical doctors. Uh, in the audience, there are a number of medical doctors here. They have a passion for patient care, or uh, diagnosis, or um, surgery, whatever. And uh, they, they can specify that, hey, I want to do something for healthcare in this area. And uh, we will be able to find an appropriate NGO which is reliable, which can be better. So functionally, geographically, as well as uh, with a specific uh, focus area. Any one of those three we can do. Um, we are, it's, all the projects are managed properly and we are in the process of developing uh, evaluation techniques so that we can have the ROI from many of the projects. Um, very low overheads, we talked about that. And uh, the last bullet here is CEO, which is uh, Dr. Vinod Prakash, and all of us board members 
or we are all pro bono. We don't take a penny and we put thousands of hours uh, collectively uh, on, over a year as volunteer, voluntary hours. How can you help with uh, help IDRF? Support the cause dear, near and dear to you. If there is a particular cause you want to donate to, we can help you. Raise the funds for IDRF. If you're talking to the people, they're saying that, hey, I want to do something in India. I'm looking for some organization who can help me do it. Direct them to us. We will help them out. Follow us on the social media. Uh, promote IDRF within your networks, which you are doing, Amit. And thank you very much for that. Uh, in fact, this program is one of them. And I, we appreciate that. And include IDRF in your trusts and wills. A lot of people are going to leave this world uh, NRIs quite wealthy and they have this desire that hey after I'm gone a certain percentage of my wealth I want to donate to India because that's where I was born that's where I got education which was for pittance and really the Indian taxpayer paid for my education that's why I'm here so I want to give back something you don't have to and you, you can leave that in the will and trust we do get that as well and we have a mechanism to organize that and of course, you can always make donations and get tax exemptions. This, this is the contact numbers. And so I gave you an overview, quick overview of how we operate, where we operate, what are the unique features and benefits to you of working through IDEA. Any, any other questions you have, we'll cover it in the question and answer. Amit Dara, back to you. Uh, thank you, Dilip ji. Uh, you you gave a, a very good insight. With a with a, I know that you know it is not easy to say uh, 33 years uh, history in uh, at 10 minutes. But uh, as a donor or as a partner, strategic partner organization, I want to say you know a couple of things. I want to share a couple of things basically. Last year when we did a we we started a um, uh, like oxygen fund, oxygen relief fund. And our parameter was to donate an organization which is based in USA, but work in India, so that you know we can, like we have some limitations. We cannot just give the money to somebody. Number one. Number two is that you know number two was we want to give the money to an organization where we can kind of have some confidence that you know money is going to the proper place. So I I did not have any interaction with IDRF. So our uh, one of the fellow members, uh, uh, Chayam Dasgupta, actually uh, you know, told uh, the name of IDRF because of their uh, so much of superlative, uh, um, uh, you know, a recommendation by charity navigators and other things, guide star. So I uh, called uh, Dr. Prakash. Uh, I didn't have any interaction with him. I I asked him in you know, a very bluntly, very uh, you know, crude question that you know, can I believe you and how can I how can I uh, uh, check that you know money is going to the right place because i i believe in straight question and he gave me a straight answer that you know i can show you the photographs and <laughs> then i saw the place where i born in west bengal uh, malda you guys have worked in malda also so these are the things actually one donor looking for you know confidence building measures the way you show that is very essential and uh, we also have Dr. Garg, uh, because you were uh, the treasurer uh, and uh, you know, the way uh, Dilipji told that, you know, you guys uh, disbursed almost like $40 million in last uh, so many years. So you, you want to say something uh, about your experience, Dr. Garg? We are on mute. Okay, uh, I, you know, I, I think uh, Lee P had uh, done a great job in explaining uh, what IDRF does, how it does it. But I can uh, assure you that the low overheads of IDRF are not because we cut corners. We, in terms of uh, uh, looking at uh, the partner NGOs that they are well managed and they are using the money for the purposes which they are intended. And from our side, we comply with all the requirements, both of uh, 
And may I add? Things tend to be quite uh, extensive, but uh, uh, hello. Yes, we can hear uh, you. Go ahead. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. besides Dr. what Dr. Uh, what Dr. Garg Prem mentioned and Dilip mentioned, uh, all these board members. Uh, from time to time, of course, COVID period is an exception. As and when they have visited India, they have visited the. Uh, they have also visited the NGOs, which were uh, important from IDR's perspective. So I think uh, uh, our board member in that respect is actively involved in the OOC. What is going on? It is not just uh, a figure, uh, uh, so so to say. Um, that's it. I wanted to supplement. Right. So, um, uh, like, um, uh, uh, before going to the next question, I want to say that you know, uh, success is not uh, final, and failure is not the fatal. It is the courage to continue. That counts. So, in in this in this context, uh, Dr. Prakash, I um, I really want to ask you one question. That you know, what kind of challenges uh, IDRA faces, and how you uh, you know overcome those challenges? Yes, I think this has been uh, takes me back to the real foundation uh, of uh, IDRF. And that goes back to the emergency imposed by Mrs. Gandhi, who was Prime Minister, uh, and that is uh, 1975 to 1977. And uh, believe it or not, uh, almost all Indians uh, had come to USA for personal reasons, whatever may they be, like uh, career and whatnot, or family and so on. But that emergency triggered interest uh, among all those who were present at that time uh, to help the motherland. And in that situation, this was the political prisoners who were put behind the bars to support the families of the breadwinners there. So India Relief Fund was established, but the emergency was lifted in 21 months. So the idea was to close. There was no need of uh, uh, India Relief Fund anymore. But given my background, especially at the World Bank, because I had traveled extensively to India by that time, I took over in uh, 1977 uh, and changed the main objective uh, to relief. In this case, it was the disaster prone, not political prisoners or any such thing. And uh, later on, I decided, which I mentioned earlier, to take full-time retirement from I mean, retirement from World Bank and devote full-time to IDRF. In that process, I committed some blunders. Blunder was, that is, the board of directors uh, were original, they were in India Relief Fund, they continued also in the uh, initial uh, phase of uh, IDRF. And that was, uh, I had to pay very heavy price for my uh, mistake. And the specific example is that uh, a super rich, Indian American wanted to take advantage of a, a personal relationship with me plus community, what is called the, um, you can say, uh, uh, Hindu Swam Sivak Sangh or Vishuddhu Parishad and all that in USA and wanted to take undue advantage. And that caused tremendous problem in a rift in the bank, sorry, in the board, I was the only one for me, nothing is supreme except the truth, satya. And I come from that kind of family. 
i had to not only this and tell the board i had to go to the court and pay first in going to the court 20000 dollars from my pocket to the lawyer which i got back later on because it was a personal struggle vinod prakash as president founder of idrf versus that super rich indian and the other two board members so uh, that was a, a shocking i i had a, i must uh, admit a severe bronchial attack and uh, thanks to dr sudhir saxaria who is in our advisory council now he rescued me as a medical doctor uh, and so on and so forth so i think uh, uh, th- that is the worst mistake which i have made in managing and thanks to that now over the past uh, i would say 8 years or more we have uh, <coughs> more and more active srt cohesive uh, board of directors and things are moving forward very smoothly yeah uh, actually you know like i i know that you know many many good work has some obstacles uh, i know in uh, 2003 or 4 probably a few people asked um, how how the money is going to india uh, maybe some uh, particular organization but you know you came out very uh, you know nicely and even even mr adwani also uh, endorsed that you know money is going to the right place where the Uh, you know it, it is needed and uh, how how uh, how um, uh, like you know how nicely you are disbursing the money to the right place uh, before uh, like you know uh, we, we it, it is it is a very short time there is no doubt about that uh, and i'm sure that we have many people here who want to ask a few questions to you but i want to start with uh, some really younger generation uh, and one of them is uh, you know um, name is siddharth and he is just 21 years old and he wants to ask you something siddharth go ahead hello everybody um can everybody hear me <coughs> yeah <coughs> so um thank you for telling me about idrf and all the work that you have done and uh, your focus areas um now to kind of related to current conflicts going on in the world that are affecting india um also i sent my question in chat if um you can hear me well um with the current conflicts going on between russia and ukraine a lot of sanctions have been placed on russia who is um one of the world's biggest oil providers and food providers of asia um i wanted to know I know that India has been affected by this and um, I was wondering how what role will IDRF play to help the impoverished people of India with these problems. Well, I at personal level I certainly admire and uh, uh, the spirit uh, and personally uh, I am uh, doing whatever i can and should like all of us uh, to help the grieving families in ukraine uh, but idrf's charter is uh, limited to primarily to india and then of course over time we extended to nepal and uh, uh, sri lanka uh, and uh, we are not uh, global in that respect and uh, we are not in a position to recommend for example long ago this is not the first time this uh, world tragedy has occurred such tragedies uh, uh, have occurred earlier also and at that time i thought whether idrf could join hands with the american red cross society uh, i don't want a things what amit ji long ago mentioned uh, i was sh- shocked that eventually 50% which is a, a, a charity you montgomery county maryland state usa international 
then it goes there so the out of 100 dollars 50 dollars were gone just in a, a overheads so from there we learned the lesson that we should leave entirely up to uh, individual sadhas and idrf should not get involved i'm sorry i to say so. well can i make a comment for sadhas can you hear me, Siddharth? Yes, yes, please. I think, I think yes. it's a good question. Siddharth, what happens is when the prices of the wheat and the oil and the energy go up, it's uh, essentially the poor people become poorer and the need becomes more accentuated. So when the need becomes more accentuated, the help to help them with the need becomes even more increased. And what we can do with, through our NGOs is when they have a need, we, we support that. Uh, it's a little different way, different thing, but COVID happened. Poor people got really badly affected. Those who came from villages to the cities and uh, they were, uh, factories got closed and they were sent back. So suddenly <clears throat> they didn't have the money and they had to go back and they didn't have a job and they were poor. So at that point, there was a significant growth in the need to support some of these people so that you can give them a little bit of help at that time so that they can stand on their feet. And IDRF came to the party and uh, we really, uh, we uh, um, divested, disbursed uh, several hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, amongst the uh, working class uh, workers uh, and food. We had food packages of chawal and dal and but Now, whether that level of problems have happened or not, but our NGOs will provide us with that feedback. The moment NGOs will say that, hey, we are noticing X number of people, they have a need for some ration because, because of this energy crisis or the wheat crisis. And uh, then we can look into that. But that should be treated as an emergency. But it's a great question. Uh, it will come indirectly through our NGOs. And we will address that. I hope I gave you some ideas. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, question and answer. Uh, if, if anybody anybody has any particular question, please feel free to uh, talk to Dr. Prakash or anybody you wants to. Yes, Tabunda. Okay. Uh, uh, first, of course, uh, uh, I'm extremely happy to hear uh, what's going on. Uh, we have been thinking about or we have been uh, looking for one, a dependable organization uh, who is doing the job and it looks like that we do have an organization who does it. Um, I have two questions, one to Dr. Prakash. Uh, I understand uh, and it's very uh, appreciable that uh, the central cost is almost zero of uh, any monetary cost. Now, now I see, of course, there are many other NGOs that are involved. So is there a cost control in that area too? Is there a mechanism by which that is done? This is my first question. And the second question is that there are many people who have opened up the hospitals. The one big problem is that the it is not affordable. And some people started as a charity type deal, but then it became more of a, uh, a modern hospital, which they had to charge quite a bit of money, etc. So my question is that first, how affordable these hospitals are? And number two, if it is affordable, that means it has to be, uh, it has to subsist on some kind of outsourced outside money. So uh, is there any other uh, mechanism by which it is sustained? Well, uh, <clears throat> very interesting questions. The first, as a part of our due diligence, uh, we make we get the basic information about a prospective uh, NGO in India, and not we don't just look into only the FCRA, because without that, we cannot uh, join hands uh, at all, uh, with some exceptions, which 
um, I don't have to elaborate at this stage. But uh, we look into their financials of past couple of years. Uh, so the overhead, we make sure that overhead is not excessive. But I think in Indian conditions, we do allow uh, like uh, uh, 5 6% to 8 9 10% uh, overhead. But we do get even those details. So we find, I just to give you an example, uh, uh, in uh, Vivekanand Kendra Kanya Kumari, uh, we are joining hands for more than two decades in their Arunachal Assam, that's called Arun Jyoti program. Uh, Dr. Ashish Adhikari is, uh, I should not have mentioned the name, but anyway, is drawing only, only 50,000 rupees a month which is a peanut for a medical doctor who is devoting not five days a week, seven days a week, not uh, uh, seven, eight hours, 12 hours a day. So that is the kind of uh, dedication and the overhead uh, certainly uh, goes down. As far as the uh, hospitals in general are concerned, we do uh, support uh, uh, like uh, as Ramakrishna Seva Ashram, Kankala Haridwar, where no patient is deprived of medi medical care. Uh, just uh, recently, we sent uh, only a week ago $25,000 to support their program of uh, their policies. It doesn't matter whether you can pay or not, you pay whatever you can. Uh, but uh, you will not be denied the medical care. And like that, there are many other hospitals. Uh, long ago, we mentioned name of Baba Ambedkar Vaidya Pratishthan or Dr. Hedgevar Hospital. And we are uh, joining hands with them for over 25 years. And they have this definite policy uh, uh, that is the uh, patient will not be deprived of the essential medical care. So wherever we have joined hands, uh, that is followed and our medical van services, uh, whether it is in West Bengal, we join hands with this called Tribal Welfare Society. Uh, in West Bengal, we have in, a, a, I think, a, more than half a dozen states in India medical services. Uh, this is at the doorsteps of the poor family with a strict, if somebody can donate something, that is great. There is a kind of piggy bank or something is there. But uh, medical care uh, should be provided without any consideration of uh, financial uh, donation or contribution by a patient. I just want to add one more thing here in uh, your question. It's a very good question. And uh, donors ask us this question all the time. So our hospitals, as you say, uh, even Dr. Prakash said that we, we are trying to do free who cannot uh, afford or affordable pricing. So the uh, your right funds should be coming uh, to run this hospital somewhere or other. And uh, that comes the CSR, the company uh, uh, social responsibility. In India, uh, they are receiving this kind of company responsibility funds. Uh, even our donors, our uh, uh, partners and RIs, they are also looking for this and they provide the funds for running these organizations. Uh, so the poor and uh, deprived people do not have to pay for the labs, do not have to pay for the medicine, do not have to pay for the surgery. Yes, we try our best not to give them any bills, but then still it is affordable pricing. We don't say everything is free, but whoever can pay, they can pay at least a little bit. That's what we do. So uh, that's the way this hospitals are running, uh, supporting uh, by support of uh, donors like you. Very good, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the response. Uh, my one question was that in these hospitals, 
or the uh, people who have money, do they pay uh, what should be paid? And uh, so is there such an arrangement? That's correct, sir. That is absolutely correct. Because our hospitals have all the facilities, uh, multi-specialty hospitals, and they don't uh, only provide this to poor, uh, like Ambedkar Hospital, which is in Aurangabad in the city. So regular patients are also can, can be treated. And if they can afford, they can pay the full uh, treatment fees to that. So it is a range and income level they see and then ask for the fees or the uh, patient fees. Or medicine. Uh, may, may I add about uh, uh, this particular hospital? IDRF has been supporting for many years uh, their program in urban slums. So the medical van, we not only financed uh, the capital cost of the medical van, but we are also meeting the operational cost. But the condition is there. No patient is denied. They go to slums and whatever uh, somebody can contribute is, that is fine. Uh, but uh, 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 my medical services are not denied. And it is uh, important to just draw kind attention of everyone that it is so important that is the ex-president of India uh, from, uh, doctor, uh, what is DRDO? This is the uh, senior moment. Uh, he was uh, ha, Abdul Kalam. Abdul Kalam, President Abdul Kalam. He was son of a, a fisherman family, and his education was done by his sisters by putting the jewelry on and borrowing money. So he still remained poor at one stage. He needed medical help. And uh, he was provided the same principle. He could not afford whatever he could pay. That was fine. So that is a shining example of uh, this. It is also called uh, in economics cross subsidy. Those who can afford who uh, pay, let them pay, but uh, none should be deprived of the uh, medical facility. Uh, if uh, you can afford, you can have an uh, air conditioned room, but those who cannot afford, they will be in the general ward, maybe 20 beds in, in a room, but medical care, surgery, and all that post care would be uh, uh, taken. Uh, without discrimination. Well, one, one additional comment, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, that's a very good question. One of the things I, I want to mention, and I've been to that uh, hospital in Aurangabad, the quality of the doctors and the quality of equipment is first class. And that is why even the people, wealthy people, want to go to that hospital. Just because it is serving some poor people free of charge, there is no compromise on the quality of the people, the quality of the doctor, medical staff, as well as the quality of the equipment available. So I was quite impressed. And as a result, you have from the both, the whole spectrum, there are people who are nearby who don't have any money and they are poor, but there are people who are in the surrounding area who are wealthy farmers who want good care. And they are willing to pay. These people are willing to pay for good good care. And these people are willing to, you know, they, they are being subsidized. So one subsidizes the other. Thank you for asking this question, Dr. Chaudhary. Any, anybody else? Any May question? I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Uh, you know, it's a IDRF is a fantastic organization. No doubt about it. But you mentioned that you don't work with the world organization. But there are sometimes you need to have some kind of uh, like WHO, World Aid Organization. They know a, a country like India, particularly rural India, has uh, having some problem related to infections. You know, some of the uh, indigenous 
Indian uh, uh, disease problem. And that can be uh, assessed by IDRF and can be funded. Some of the people who are working in this area, in those areas like filaria, dengue, uh, malaria, something like that. So uh, my intention to uh, ask you said that doing this, you can have a better opportunity and understanding some of the uh, research related thing, which you can, could be funded by your organization. Uh, definitely, sir, that is correct. And this is a very good question. And uh, uh, Mr. Dar, uh, we, uh, as we said before, we are working with the on-ground NGO who are working from long time there. So they are, uh, they are having this collaboration with uh, many big organizations like WHO, UNICEF, because UNICEF is doing a very good job in India. Yes. Uh, yes. So that way, uh, we are not directly connected with them. Our funds not go to them, but go to NGO who is working on ground, but taking the uh, advice, taking the help from the, this big organization like us, we just help them with the uh, project-based uh, health expertise. Uh, and uh, our board, all the board members come from World Bank. They are all World Bank retirees, most of them are. So they are coming with the World Bank, uh, that technology, that expertise, and that uh, experts goes in that NGOs, uh, and then we collaborate indirectly with them. Not directly, but that's why we don't we have any offices in India, but we work through this NGO who are uh, also expert in this villages and this area where they are working. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Very good idea. Can I have a, uh, a comments, uh, Binod Prakash ji? Uh, you know, the, uh, you graduated from ISI. And I have weakness about ISI because as a graduate student of Bosch Institute, I took some courses in ISI to R.L. Brahmachari, Rotolal Brahmachari. And S.C. Mohanlavish, when he instituted this insti uh, the institution, he bring the people, not they have the academic, uh, you know, the PhD or master or things like that. They bring who has the experience about this area. So I know your background with that, you can make a lot of difference. Well, thank you for sharing your experience and my I had the honor to work directly with Professor Prashant Mahlanavis, the founder ah, okay. of wow. the IDRF. And that was in the context of developing, designing perspective planning. That is the after independence, uh, India started with five air plans. So yes. first fiber plan of India was nothing but uh, putting all the long-term investment project during the British time, whether it is uh, the dams and so on and so forth together. Uh, but second year was there was something, but uh, then what is called the long-term planning. So I had worked with uh, uh, Professor Malnavis both in Calcutta, but more so in Delhi. Um, so it's a, a very sweet memories. I have an interesting thing is, when I got the Ford Fellowship, uh, so I had resigned from, uh, uh, the, uh, from ISI, uh, but my resignation was not accepted. And I had to see personally Professor Mahalanavis and he instructed he asked me one question, are you coming back to India? And I said, yes, which I did. I stayed in uh, USA only for two years and returned to uh, India. So I have uh, very fine recollections about my days in Calcutta and uh, ISI and so on. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dhar, and thank you, Dr. Prakash. We'll, have to, we'll take one more question. But before that, um, we, 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 um, I want to have some rapid fire question, you know, some, some, some quick uh, thought to Dr. Prakash. So Dr. Prakash, are you ready? Yes. Okay. What's your hobby? 
seeking uh, inner joy, Atma Santushti, that is my hobby. But in my daily routine, uh, if you say hobby, I do yoga for uh, every day in the morning. I do treadmill almost every day in the morning. I do pranayam almost every evening in the morning. If uh, for me, they are the hobbies because my world is uh, confined to the four walls, so, uh, not just because of COVID, but uh, because of my uh, total loss of eyesight. That is really great. Second question, what motivates you? I think uh, I, throughout my life, I have seen uh, that is the the selfless service is always paid off. It never goes waste. And I, I recall the Swami Vivekananda's quotation that if you see a deprived person, a poor, marginalized, crying, come forward, join hands with him or her. See the divinity in him. God is behind you. It is your privilege. God is at your doorstep to help. So uh, my hobby in that sense is mana seva, madhav seva. Service to humanity is service to God. And that yes. has enabled me, uh, especially carrying on the last 12 years of uh, shocking life experience. With, with this extension, one last thing I want to ask you. Any short message you want to pass on to the younger generation? Well, I think uh, they should always look forward that uh, after their education, they should share some and share their joy uh, with the marginalized or deprived and that is the best insurance policy health insurance policy uh, they can have and the it is to be realized this is not theoretical you listen in a classroom atma santushti or inner joy that is to be realized and i am sure uh, that young children uh, i'm based on the experience of uh, my grandchildren, I can assert that uh, uh, no student uh, uh, should be uh, deprived of this immense joy. Once he or she tries, I'm sure that they would be, uh, that would be realized. Thank you, sir, for your um, answers. And uh, I will go to the last question. But before that, uh, it will be very injustice for me, at least, uh, not to specially mention name of Bandanaji. Uh, uh, the very uh, first moment, uh, you know, like I am, she is the contact person. She uh, did everything, whatever questions I <clears throat> I had, and uh, whenever I called her, she usually she always you know either pick up the phone or give me the message that you know we'll we'll call you back. Uh, and uh, thank you, Bandanaji, for uh, helping and supporting this event. Um, anybody else want to ask any question, Dr. Prakash or Tim? <clears throat> Please go ahead. Hey, uh, first, I, I really want to uh, thank the panel and the congratulate them for doing uh, immense work. This is my dream that uh, I think that if we could participate in any any form would be fantastic and here again people talk about it but we are we have the examples uh, who actually are doing it so uh, thank you thank you very much thanks for arranging this talk too so uh, congratulations yeah i have i have one thing i'd like to say that how we can involve or help Amitav, you can give us all the information and see whether we can do whatever we can do for the organization. That's a good question and highly motivating question for us and for others that uh, Sangam, 
is a very small organization but uh, we have a big dream uh, and uh, uh, we have a broad mind also so uh, whatever way we can we can help uh, idrf uh, and we can help india through idrf we will do and people of kansas city are very and uh, broad minded and they are very enthusiastic to help uh, each other and the community so, amitabh ji you have our uh, contact info you have our uh, email information please pass on to anybody who wants to uh, to contact us again uh, kansas city uh, group uh, and sangam group they have helped in covid uh, with us they were partnering with us uh by fundraising by asking question where money is going what we are doing what is the progress uh amitabh ji always ask that question and keep us on our toe and same thing we are expecting back from your organization and we are ready to help we are, we are ready to collaborate with you and amitabh ji once again thank you there were no words are enough to express uh gratitude of entire idea of t uh so and we look forward to our continued clo closer collaboration than here to hope yes we will we will definitely be uh, in touch with you and uh so i don't think anybody has any other uh, question so uh, for all the audience uh, who are uh, listening this uh, beautiful show through uh, other social media thank you for joining and uh, we'll come back again next month with some different uh, uh, topic with some different guest and uh, please support us uh, this is a program through which we are trying to uh, learn from each other learn from the community and we are trying to motivate people that in the life it is not important how much you are gathering it is important how much you are scattering Uh, so uh, let's scatter and uh, uh, you know have a have a atma santushti as as dr prakash told atma santushti self uh, you know a sense of accomplishment that is very important at the in the, in the life so thank you for joining uh, i am going to stop the live stream first and